Shabbat Shalom. I'm Rabbi Robert Barr, and I'm delighted that you're joining me and others for this streaming Shabbat service. We live in challenging times, and we all need to step back and catch our breath. For six days we speak, and tonight we listen. Six days we build, and tonight we rest. Six days we take care of others. Tonight we nurture ourselves. Six days we work to change our world. Tonight we are renewed by what is eternal. Six days we plan for the future. Tonight we are enveloped in the present. Six days we eat and drink in haste. Tonight we savor the taste of bread and wine and feel the bond of the world that feeds us. Six days we teach. Tonight we learn. Six days we hear the clamor. Tonight we listen for clarity. Six days we struggle to expand our influence. Tonight we've dissolved in a greater influence. Six days we focus our vision of the task at hand. Tonight we look beyond what we can see. May each of us find our Sabbath peace. Shabbat Shalom. Again, I'm Rabbi Robert Barr of Congregation Beth Adam. That's our bricks and mortar congregation here in greater Cincinnati and our Jewish community our online congregation. We've been online for over 10 years. We recognize that the internet allowed us the opportunity to connect with people around the world who are interested in the voice and expression of Judaism that we give voice to here at Congregation Beth Adam. But more, during this pandemic, when we have had to socially distant from one another in order to, to keep each other safe, the internet has become even more important and our streaming services allows us to connect both with people around the world and people in Cincinnati who we don't get to be with because we aren't coming to our bricks and mortar congregation, Beth Adam. Technology allows us to know that we're part of a community. But more than that, it is the expression of Judaism, the voice of Judaism, that is particularly important. Here at Congregation Beth Adam, for 40 years, we've been giving expression to a bold, dynamic voice of Judaism. A Judaism less concerned with what our ancestors thought or what they did, and more concerned about what are we leaving for our descendants? What are we teaching them? Our ancestors were informed by the knowledge they had, and we're informed by knowledge that they never had access to. It only makes sense that Judaism needed to change to incorporate science and modernity, and more than just change in the classroom, it also needed to change in the sanctuary. That's why we have rewritten our services to give expression to a more modern, dynamic Judaism. So I'm glad you're here sharing this Shabbat with me and with each other. You can leave messages, you can chat. That's one of the very nice things of being in an online congregation. If you're chatting, please let us know where you're participating from. Please make sure your chats are welcoming. If you tend to like to talk, go to bethadam.org and click on our streaming service. There's a group of folks who really like to talk there. Uh, or you can stay on one of the Facebook pages if you like. Also, we recognize too that you may not be able to watch services at six o'clock Eastern time. That is also an advantage of an online congregation. You can participate whenever it is convenient for you, whenever your schedule allows for you to step out of your daily routine. So I am delighted you're here and we're gonna continue our service with the lighting of the Shabbat candles. On Shabbat, we light the candles. Candles bring forth light, illuminating the darkness Candles offer us warmth, providing comfort. Candles awaken us as we reach for possibilities. As we light the candles, let us use their light to stretch beyond ourselves, touching others, bettering our world. Baruch ha'or ba'olam, blessed is the light within the world. Baruch ha'or ba'adam, blessed is the light within each person. Baruch ha'or ba'shabbat, blessed is the light of the Sabbath. Aha. Well, it took three strikes, and rather than out, it got lit. Yay! So we're good. Candles lit. Okay. Ah. So some of you know that I've always had challenges with matches, and sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. I got it. Took three strikes. Got the candles lit. So we're good. 
So I am delighted to be sharing with you a conversation that I recorded several weeks ago with Stu Krieger, TV and screenwriter, and uh, a fascinating, fascinating man. So I hope you enjoy our conversation. It is a great delight for me to be having a conversation with Stu Krieger from his home in California. Uh, Stu is a writer. He has written works that probably many of you know, Land Before Time, Where the Boys Are, and Amazing Stories. More than 30 writing credits for TV series, TV movies, and more. Produced and co-produced more than 18 movies or shorts. I've written a novel, the, That One Cigarette, and you're a professor of screen and television writing at the University of California, Riverside, Department of Theater, Film, and Digital Production, and the creative yep. writing, is that correct? Creative writing for the performing arts yep. at UCR. And that's how our paths actually cross, because my brother was in that department as well, and that's actually where my brother got sick. That's probably the very, very first time I spoke to you. So... You, but what I didn't see when I checked all of your credits, that you were also a consultant on Beth and Am's High Holidays this year. <laughs> Probably there you're going to put that on the top of your bio now. So I'm, I'm delighted you're here. And I just want to, before we sort of get into the interview itself, to check how you, your, your wife Hillary is doing and your family, everyone's safe and healthy out in California? Yes, very much. Thank you so much. And Part of what has gotten us through this pandemic is we have our first grandchild coming in December. Oh, congratulations, Mazel tov. That's yeah. very exciting. That's yeah. great. So the expectation and anticipation of that has gotten us a long way through all of this. Sure, sure. Well, that's what we want to talk about is how we get sort of through the pandemic. And the, what we're going to be talking about is not all the writing that you've done and all the uh, films and TV shows that you created, but you did a TED Talk called Choosing Joy. Uh, that I watched, and I, I want to. You, you talked about choosing joy, and I'd like to explore that with you uh, for a bit. So, how did you? Could you share some how you got to that place, how you made that decision to make that TED talk, and and what you said? Yeah, when I was I was approached by the university that does an annual TEDx event, and usually what those are, there's three or four, sometimes five TED talks in an evening, uh, in front of a live audience, and then filmed to be part of the TED library. And so I am always somebody as a person and as a professor who constantly says, say yes, everything's an opportunity, everything leads to something, and then figure out what you have to do from there. So I naively said yes. Hmm. Uh, I had absolutely no knowledge that a TED Talk meant you are on stage in front of 500 people with no script, no cue cards, no safety net whatsoever. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so when I went to get further information, I was like, I have to do what now? Uh, so there was a little bit of that. And then when they were talking about, you know, what are some of the topics you might want to talk about? I was saying one of the consistent things that happens to me during office hours with my students is they will come in and they will talk about their future. And I'm so freaked out and I'm so worried about this and I'm so concerned. And especially if I want to be in the entertainment business and how do I know I'm making the right choice? And, and I said, I am always somebody who's going to lead as your professor with figure out the life you want and then build a career that accommodates that rather than the other way around mm -hmm. talking about that with them. It's always, even in, <coughs> excuse me, my entertainment career, there were times when opportunities were offered, but I would research them and find out this is a writing staff that's usually here till midnight, six days a week. And that wasn't the life I wanted. And I would say, I'm sorry, you know, very flattering. You're interested in me, but I'm not interested in this job. That's not the life I want. Mm -hmm. And I was somebody who was always incredibly present as my children were growing up. Most of my, you know, that time my office was at home. I was a freelance writer, so I could schedule, you know, my kids come in and say the Halloween parades today at 10 o'clock. Can you be there? It's like, I'll be there. Sure. Uh, so the choose joy concept came about as somebody who really feels like we don't understand the power we have to make the choices about how our life path is going to go. And another really poignant example for, with that for me was, in 2000, probably four or five, I was at this position in my writing career, everything you ever heard about, it's an ages business. At some point, you're not the new kid in town anymore. You're not the hot young writer. Right. And things were slowing down. I was going out for jobs. I was in the interview going, boy, I hope I don't get this because I don't want to write this thing. But, you know, I still got to support my family. Sure. And at the same time, I was teaching one class a year at the Peter Stark Producing Program at USC. And one night I came up from teaching that class and my wife said, 
you are so happy when you're teaching. You have this energy and this just joy, you know, that you don't have anymore when you're going out on these interviews for jobs you hate. Maybe you should be teaching more. And wow. I was like, hmm, there's some good advice. Uh, you know, so I met with a couple of friends who were teaching. I went on the Chronicle of Higher Education website. The immediate thing that popped up was the posting for the Riverside job. Oh, really? Yeah. And it said, must have teaching experience and industry experience. And I went, this guy. Um, and, you know, applied for the job, got the job and moved my career from full-time writing to full-time academia. But that was the place I was finding joy. So, so, but before that, you were finding joy in writing. How, how did you yeah. decide? I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, it's not a strange career. It's a complicated career. How did you go from being like a high school kid doing whatever you did in high school and say, I want to write movies? Yeah. Uh, I was a bit of a freak. And by that, I mean, I grew up in Rochester, New York, with absolutely no connection to the entertainment industry at all. And starting about first or second grade, I was saying to first, I thought I wanted to be an actor. And then probably by middle school, knew I wanted to be a writer. And I would say to my parents, you know, as soon as I possibly can, I'm going to move to L.A. and work in the film business. And, you know, where that came from, where I had the chutzpah to think it was something I could actually do, I don't know. Um, I've had students say to me, you know, why do you think you succeeded and I will say, because I was too stupid to know what the odds were against me. <laughs> you know, I really came out here at a time when none of the, you know, kind of the proliferation of entertainment tonight shows and the internet and all the information wasn't available. I knew what I knew from, you know, watching movies and whatever, but it, but it was a much more, you know, limited access to understanding how it actually worked. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways that naivete really served me. And then once I started to pursue it, I didn't have a plan B. So it's like, okay, this has to work. Right. <laughs> you know, because I have no idea what else I would do. Mm -hmm. And you and you did that for, I mean, the bulk of your adult life was was writing. Yeah. I had and, a 30 plus year career where I was a freelance, freelance film and television writer. What what's the hardest part of that career? Um, the faith, keeping the faith. So it really, especially, you know, I was very lucky in the fact that I had very incremental but forward moving success. So, you know, got my first agent, then got my first very low budget film job. Then that led to a meeting with a the producer. Then, you know, I my then girlfriend, now wife of almost 40 years, was working for Gary Marshall. And Gary said, so who is this guy you're dating? Can I read something he wrote? And <laughs> Gary read a script and he optioned it. And then he hired me to work on a project with him. And that got some buzz and other people saying, who's this kid Gary's working with? I want to meet him. So I was really fortunate that each year there was something that I could point to that I'm a step farther than I was the year before. But in terms of your question about the most difficult part, it's really, especially once I had a wife and children, keeping the faith that the next job will happen. And, right. and so interesting is, you know, I've seen incredibly successful actors with 40 year careers on the Tonight Show or whatever, talking about, Every time I finish a job, I'm sure I'm never going to work again. Hmm. And that's kind of the way the industry is built. And then the other way it's built is to hang on to your money as long as they can. Mm -hmm. So there were times when, you know, I was six months out of finishing a job for the Disney Channel and still hadn't been paid my production bonus. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you're calling and going, OK, that's great. But I've got two kids in college and I've got this due and that due. You owe me this money. Let's go. Right. And, you know, trying to keep that faith and keep that sanity and keep a family together in the middle of all of that, that was the, really the biggest challenge. Hmm. And what was the joy that you found in it? Uh, there is, will never ever be some anything to equal the feeling of the first day you walk onto the set of a new project and you have that moment of, I was sitting all alone in my office, I was staring at a blank computer screen or I'm enough of an old fart that there was a time when I was staring at the blank typewriter page right. with my white out there my side, you know, but, but starting with the blank page, whatever the conveyance was, and then walking onto a set and going, oh my God, look at the living room looks like I envisioned it. And then the actor looks like she's in the costume that I had in my mind when I was writing this. And there's a hundred people here and they're making my vision come to life. You know, that's number one. And then number two, there was a whole other level of joy because most of my career was family entertainment. And a lot of that family entertainment took place from the mid 80s to the early 2000s. And as soon as my professor life began, if, and, and this is literal, if I had a dollar for every time a student came in and said a version of the sentence, 
dude, you wrote my childhood. You know, I would be retiring now. Wow. And there's nothing, you know, I, you cannot even begin to articulate the joy of a kid coming in and going, you know, I can't believe I'm taking a class from the guy who wrote this, 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 and this that I grew up on. Or, you know, I had one student come in and say, our, in my house, the ritual was my dad and I watched the Disney Channel original movies every Friday night together. And the way when I was involved with them, they were doing a new movie every month. So you, and you wrote a lot of those. Those you yeah. were one of the most prolific, I think, writers at Disney at that that for time. Yeah, the statistic I could give you because I'm very proud of it was they had a party celebrating the first 50 movies they made, and I had written 10 of them. Wow, that's significant. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So when the kids come in and they go, you know, well, this one particular kid I was saying that watched him every Friday night with his dad. He said, "Would you mind if I just called my dad and, let, and say hi to him because I'm going to tell you know?" And he got on the phone. And he was like, "Dad." You won't believe it. My professor wrote Smart House and Xenon and True Confessions. Will you say hi to him? And I'm like, hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> that had to be a rush. And then you found, and then moving into teaching became an opportunity to, to share your, your wealth of knowledge with, with students and, yeah. and inspire them as well. Yeah. I mean, one, this is a really poignant and as, as current example as I can possibly give you. But a week ago, Tuesday in class, I was very, very distracted. It was election day. I was trying to keep it together. I was trying, you know, not to get hysterical and focus on the class. And I said something that just was a complete and total lie because I was covering something I said incorrectly. And class ended and I was laying in bed that night amid everything else that was going on going, I don't want to be that teacher. And, and so when class started yesterday, I said, instead of true confessions today, guys, it's Stu's confessions. I got to tell you, when I said that last week, I, it was a big fat lie. I was distracted by the election. I'm completely wrong. Here's the truth of it. Here's the misstatement I made. I'm apologizing to all of you, but I want to be the guy that is authentic and real with you as opposed to, I don't need to be perfect. I don't need to be right all the time. And that, you know, yeah, and, and there's such a liberating joy in that of being able to say and sincerely mean, which I say often to them is, I learn as much from you as you learn from me. Mm -hmm. So I need to make this that exchange. Right. And the idea of choosing joy, how did, w w in, a, in a couple sentences, what does that mean to you? When you, what did you want to share at the TED Talk you shared with the students? Yeah, it was really about at all of these crossroads that are inevitable in each of our lives. It's taking the moment and saying, so here are the, some of the things I'm grappling with. Here are some of the choices in front of me. If I tune down all the noise, if I take out all the expectations of what do my parents want, what did I think I wanted because of it's going to get me, you know, a new Tesla or, you know, whatever it is. But if you can turn down all the noise and go, well, what really makes me happy? What's right. the thing when I'm alone and sitting there and going, you know, this makes me smile. This makes my heart warm. What is that? Hmm. And then try to steer the path in that direction versus, you know, all those other externals and things that, like I said, are living up to someone else's expectations, but you're going to be miserable. And, you know, I now have friends that, <laughs> excuse me, have been friends since childhood who will talk about things like, you know, I so regret my wedding day because I allowed my in-laws to steamroll, blah, 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 blah. Right, and, sure. You know, or they'll say, you know, I did a career for 30 years that I really never loved, but it was what my parents expected of me or wanted of me. And I always felt very fortunate that that was not my life. You know, when I wanted to leave Rochester and become a writer, I went and did that. And when I knew it was time to leave that and go on to chapter two, it was okay to be a writer. And, and I was in the shrinks office talking about this crisis point when I was trying to decide the next move. And he said, you know, what are you hanging on to with the entertainment career? And I said, I feel like if I walk away from it, in some ways, I'm a failure. Hmm. And he said, you know, started listing credits and, you know, all the things you've done and all the opportunities. Why? And I said, because I just feel like, you know, I couldn't hack it or I couldn't continue to do it. And he said, but are you having any fun anymore? No. Well, are you in a financial place where you could comfortably make a move? Yeah. And he kind of like, you know, so, and that was the inspiration of, okay, I'm going to do where the joy, go to where the joy is. That, yeah, that's, yeah, it's wonderful. And it's, 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 it's courageous too. I have to say, I mean, it's, it's finding that joy and then having the courage to make those choices. Because sometimes it's easier to do the, you know, the, the path well-traveled, you know, the okay. easier one, the one your parents want us to do, the one that seems simpler. But yeah. to, to do what you do and then to inspire students to do that is really great. 
Well, I hope so. I mean, because I, I really, really do feel like, you know, all the cliches about we don't have a whole lot of time here. Uh, you know, the again, the next evolution of the joy of it is students coming in. And one of the things that happened that's kind of the emblem, you know, emblematic of it all was in 2017, I believe, I got an email out of the blue from the Riverside Film Festival saying you've been nominated to be to receive a lifetime achievement award this year for your writing career and uh the other recipient of the award will be ed asner for the acting prize wow and, and, and there was another one of those moments where i went wait like you sure you got the right guy on the phone you know <laughs> wait there's a nice two career let me check <laughs> yeah, like me and ed asner it's not quite lining up for me but i'm very flattered Mm -hmm. um, but then once we went further with it, they said, we would love to put together a highlight reel of your career to be able to show as we're presenting the award. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. one of the things I said to them is, well, I'm in a film department. Maybe that's something I could have my students do and make it a project for them. And what they ended up doing is they were taking all these clips from my films, but then in between each one, interviewing their fellow students and like, what was your favorite stew movie? What was your favorite stew moment? You know, whatever right. it was. That's and right. then the inadvertent thing that happened was as each of them were talking about them, they started talking about me as a professor and the things they've learned from me and things they've taken away from it. And, you know, as you can imagine, you know me well enough, the first cut when they sent it to me, I was sitting at the computer bawling and just like, you know, tears go streaming down my face. But it was hearing back, I remember the day he said this and when he taught me that and, you know, and I just had, I got the visual aid. I just got this recently from a student it's a writer's block. Oh, that's great. Um, and on one side, it says, a great teacher, but an even greater person. And then under, yep, 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 which was a quote from Land Before Time, and then Professor Stu Krieger. And when I wrote to thank him, and I said, you know, that's unbelievably sweet and touching and so thoughtful and everything. He said, well, I remembered in class one day, somebody asked you how you dealt with writer's block. And you said, you never had writer's block, you had a mortgage. <laughs> so, <laughs> He said, so I knew it was time for you to finally have a writer's block. And that's why I say it. That's, that's, that's very sweet. I, I think, you know, they, 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 teaching is an amazing experience. And particularly when you get to op help people find themselves, share with them, and, and you begin to realize how much you touch their lives is, is really profound. So it, you started out by saying you, you're, you're going to have a grandchild in December which is helping you get through this is the chaos and the pandemic. Could you imagine sitting with your grandchild at some future date, watching one of your family films with the child? And, and how would that feel? Wonderful. Because um, the, the little bit of a preview that I've had is now several of my former students are in their 30s and having their own families. And at least two or three times a year, I'll get either a video clip or a still of them on the couch with their kid watching Land Before Time. And they always, you know, it's over the shoulder so I can see them and the TV. And the caption is usually, look what we're watching, exclamation mm -hmm. point. And again, you know, how can it be more moving and touching and, you know, circle of life than that? That's so, great. Yeah. So to have that opportunity with my own grandkid, can't wait. That's really exciting. Wow. I mean, you, to, to think that, you know, I appreciate you taking the time and sharing with us both your experiences writing and your, your experience as, as an educator and recognizing the contribution you made to sort of American culture and the culture, the, the lives of a lot of kids. A lot of people have grown up with you, didn't yeah. know you, right. but you influenced them. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's something you can't anticipate. And one of the beautiful, you know, kind of mentors and guides I've had in that is when I was a kid and it's mentioned in the Ted talk that I had this unbelievable crush on Haley Mills, you know, the big Disney star of the sixties. And then in the mid eighties, I got to write the sequel to parent trap for the Disney channel that she starred in as the adult of her adult version of her characters. And we've remained friends ever since that experience. And, you know, just this week we're exchanging emails, but when she was honored by Turner classic movies, it was probably five years ago. And she invited my wife and I to come along for the day. And we were sitting there, an audience full of people, mostly our age, talking about all of their connections to her and all of their experiences with her. And she was being interviewed by Leonard Malton. And he said, you know, does this ever get old? And she said, how can it possibly get old to hear how much you've touched people's lives, especially as part of their childhood? And, you know, for her, those movies are 60 years old and people are still coming up. There was people with their parent trap, you know, record albums they wanted her to sign and Pollyanna DVDs and, you know, whatever it was. But she, hearing her articulate that, of, you know, it's never going to get old because they're talking to me about
about how I touched their lives. Right. That's really, that's very powerful, both in you, through your, the writing and through the teaching. And I think that that's something that you can be incredibly proud of. I, 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 and that, that you touch people in, in a deep and profound way. And that is something special. I think we all have that capacity to do that. We may not do it in writing, uh, we may not do it in teaching, but I think each of us has that ability to, to connect with people in some way. Yeah. And you've taught us that. Well, so. I appreciate it. So thank you so much for sharing. It was, it was one, it's wonderful. I hope to get out to Cal, back to California someday when we're traveling again. Yeah, and get to, can't wait to have you here. And get, and get to see you again. So you be safe and stay healthy. Have great, uh, great holiday season. And, and congratulations on looking forward to December. That's very exciting. Thank you. And best to your family as well. Thanks. So I hope you enjoyed meeting Stu and our conversation. Uh, we turn now to remembrance. We pause to recall those whom death has taken from us. We do this once a month here at Beth Adam and our Jewish community. If there's a name that you hold in your heart tonight and you don't think I have it or will be reading it, please feel free to type it into the chat now. Let us know who you are thinking about. The cycle of life unfolds. Just as we rejoice in new life, we mourn its final ending. The inevitable death of those whose lives have touched ours. Tonight, we join voices with others as we say aloud the words which help us to recall those we've lost. We remember the moments we've shared, the, the laughter and the tears, the beauty and the pain. Inevitably, as our lives intertwined, as we have touched one another, we've been influenced, changed, enriched by their presence. And so as we mourn their loss, we celebrate their life. Thus, the cycle continues their lives forever marking the continued unfolding of our own. We pause at this time to reflect upon those who are no longer among us. This moment of remembrance links life to life and generation to generation. We begin by recalling those recent deaths, Judy Avner, Mark Loberbaum, Suzanne Lichtenfeld, Shirley Skolnick, now we recall those, the anniversary of whose death occurs in this month of December. Leon Alex, Elaine B. Avner, Shirley Brown, Kenneth Carlson, Ben Cohen, Annie Donut, Jane Ellis, Sarah Fleischer, Francis Freed, Jane K. Friedlander Steinfurst, Walter E. Glass Sr., Fanny Goldman, Michael Golovin, Mayo Gottliebson, Samford J. Green, Daniel Greenfield, Jean Grossman, Helen Holt, Leslie R. Jaffe, Meyer Stanley Jolson, Robert Wan, Irving Neil Clark, Julia Koppel, Martin I. Levy, Esther Lipsitz, Grace McGee, Minnie M. Marcus, Alan Marks, Valva Mary, Mildred Matowski, Wendy Munich, Betty Aders, Leo Romanik, Florence Rodner, Morris Rosen, Ann Sachs, Jacob Sachs, Simeon Simon, Lucille Feinberg Spitz, Augusta Steinhardt, Harder, Lois Stern, David Charles Strauss, Marion Vogel, Leslie Wolfson, Harriet R. Zawatsky, George Ziegler, and we continue with names that were sent by members of our online community. Donald Burnett, Elsa De Beer, Marie Ditzler, Evelyn Chrisom, Peter Costello, Robert Vandermeter, James Langseth Sr., Dina McMahon, June Runchen, Sam Runchen. And along with those individuals, we recall 300,000 Americans who've died as a result of the pandemic of the coronavirus that keeps us socially distant. And we think of the tens of thousands of others around the world who has died from this pandemic. We think too of those who've died as a result of violence and terror and war and genocide that mars our planet. We think of those who die defending the principles of justice and of peace and of democracy. 
think about those who have no one to recall them this night. And we think of all our loved ones whom death has taken from us. Ein bideha mavata koach la'akor majetamun balev. Death cannot take that which is locked in our hearts. With our tears and our sorrow, we remember. With our courage and our strength, we do not forget. Acts of kindness, deeds of courage will remain. Beauty created, wisdom shared is not lost. With our tears and our sorrow, we remember. Im dama op einenu, be'et eflenu, nishmor al secher achuvenu. With our tears in our sorrow, we remember. Zeker tzedik livracha, may the memory of good people bless our days. Let the Sabbath be a time for believing in what could be and seeing with new eyes. In the serious world, let us take ourselves less seriously. In these harsh times, let us listen for a soothing word. While the world around us unfolds in an instant, let us judge each other a little more slowly. Let the Sabbath shine a light into a corner of ourselves where, where hope's renewed. Let us remember a reason to be joyful, a way to be gentle. Let the Sabbath be a time for, for opening up. Let us find strength in our dreams and trust in our strength. Now we continue with our virtual sharing of the challah and wine. We do this because sharing food is a custom that draws us together. And it's something that many of us are longing to do. Social distancing has meant that we haven't had those family meals, those occasions to sit down with family or friends. And we long for that. And soon, I hope, we'll be able to do that once more. But tonight, we continue with the virtual hala, an affirmation that joining together and being social creatures is so incredibly important. In Jewish tradition, we share the hala as we celebrate the Sabbath. It reminds us a twisted loaf of bread that sustains and nurtures the life of our body. May the sharing of this hala sustain and nurture our hunger for knowledge and understanding of the world around us. May the sharing of the hala sustain and nurture our connection to those close by and those separated by distance and by time. May the sharing of the hala encourage us to reach out to those across our rooms, across our hallways, to those across the desks and across the miles. May the sharing of the hala strengthen and enrich the coming week. Baruch HaMal Kapenu, blessed is the work of our hands. Baruch HaZon HaAdam, blessed is the vision of our mind. Baruch Lecha Ma'aretz, blessed is the bread of the earth. And then I give some juice or some wine, join with me. Shabbat is our custom to share wine with family, friends, and community. It reminds us that it's not enough for us to, to quench our physical thirst. We must nourish, nourish our spirit as well. As we celebrate Shabbat, May this wine remind us to live our lives to the fullest and to embrace the joys and pleasures that life offers. Ruchim chachayim ba'olam, blessed is the life within the world. Ruchim chachayim ba'adam, blessed is the life within each person. And we say, l'chayim, to life. So I'm glad we were able to share this Shabbat service together. The next two Shabbat services, which happens to be Christmas Day and New Year's Day, it's going to be a, a shorter service, an abbreviated service, a reading or two, the candle lighting, sharing of challah and wine, but no conversations. Uh, we're taking a little bit of time off, trying to catch our breath. We all are during these challenging times. I hope during this holiday season, you're staying safe, you're social distancing, and you're able to connect if not uh, uh, three of Zoom with, with family and friends and know that even though we are socially distant, we are part of a community. So I'm so glad you're here. Again, starting on January 8th, we'll have uh, a guest with us sharing the Shabbat. If you're able to, please make a donation to, to Beth Adam and our Jewish community. To do so, you would go to bethadam.org and there you'd see a pay. Uh, tag that says uh, donate and you can go to a page and there's a drop down menu and if you can make a donation you put it in place it into our Jewish community. I know that some people have already done that. Thank you so much. I know that some people aren't able to. This is challenging times and economically can be difficult for many people. Uh, so we understand that. Under Know that your donations are helpful financially and they're also an affirmation that people value the work that we're doing.
When you're at bethadam.org, you can listen to my podcast. In fact, you could listen to the most current one is always on the homepage, but you can go to the little button that says bars banner, click it, and you can go back in time and, and listen to podcasts that I've been recording for many years now. So I'm glad you're here. I hope you stay safe and stay healthy. And we end with the words, may we know blessings those who are near. May we know blessings those who are far. And may the Sabbath bring its goodness to everyone soon, wherever they are. Shabbat Shalom.